Hi, I'm Jennifer Allen reporting for RSNA News. I'm talking today with Dr. Thomas Hope, Director of Molecular Therapy in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging at the University of California, San Francisco. We're talking about how molecular imaging is opening new doors in prostate cancer treatment. Thank you, Dr. Hope, for joining me today. Thank you. So first question, molecular imaging has long held potential in cancer research. What was holding it back? Well, that's a great question, but I think one of the things you need to keep in mind is that it's actually already a cornerstone of imaging and staging of patients with cancer. So FDG PET soon after 2000 became really one of the bread and butter ways of staging patients with prostate cancer. Well, not prostate cancer, but other cancers. And it really has taken time to sort of extend that beyond just imaging metabolism. And I think that's where the promise that is slowly becoming a uh, appreciated now is finally happening. And, and what's changed, I think, over time is a couple of things. So one is the type of radio traces that were used. So we're doing a lot more imaging with non-fluorinated compounds. So gallium being one example, having the wide availability of those radionuclides for imaging. And then also the discovery of small molecules that target the proteins that are on the surface of these cancer cells. So things like dotatate or octreotide analogs, uh, and also obviously in the in the sense of PSMA, the small molecule based on the urea motif for targeting PSMA. And then obviously having the capabilities that were developed for FDG, widespread availability of PET CTs, cyclotron facilities, radio pharmacies that are able to distribute them. All of these things, you know, 30 years ago seems sort of far-fetched, uh, but are actually all now a clinical reality and really set the stage for being able to have widespread implementation of novel radio tracers in the cancer clinic for staging of patients. So specifically, how is molecular imaging impacting prostate cancer research at this time? Yeah, well, the nice thing is it's not just impacting prostate cancer research, but it's actually impacting prostate cancer uh, currently. So uh, the thing that's really unique with prostate cancer compared to other types of cancers out there is we have PSA. So as you treat something, some patient with prostate cancer, the PSA oftentimes will go to zero. Uh, meaning that we've gotten rid of their disease. And when the PSA, this lab value starts to rise, then you know there's a recurrent disease uh, and you don't know where it is. And the FDG PET or other imaging modalities have a very, very low sensitivity for localizing that disease. But if you can see where the disease is, you can potentially treat those patients with curative external beam radiation therapy to ablate it. And so that is where these novel molecular imaging techniques are really making a huge change in the way patients are treated and then ho hopefully in the long term, their outcomes. So there is an FDA-approved drug, fluciclovine, a fluorinated compound that's been around and FDA-approved since 2016. And now the next generation, the PSMA PET radio tracers are just being approved right now, and we were involved in that. Um, and then those are really having a huge impact in the way these patients are treated. Uh, if you look in the change in management data out there, over half of the patients imaged with PSMA PET have a significant change in management compared to their pre-imaging management uh, decision-making. So it's really impressive. Uh, now we just need to prove that it's actually improving their long-term outcome. So can you talk a little bit about gallium-68 PSMA-11 and explain its impact on prostate cancer? So gallium-68 PSMA-11 is a subtype of a PSMA PET radio tracer. So PSMA is a prostate-specific membrane antigen protein overexpressed on prostate cancer cells. And there are many, many different molecules that target that protein. Uh, historically, we would think of processant, which is a spec imaging agent uh, that didn't work very well because it had to bind to the intracellular portion of the protein. Uh, but now we have a whole family of small molecules that target this. So for example, there's F18 DCFPYL, uh, PSMA1007, which is a fluorinated compound, and then PSMA11, which is the compound that we use here at UCSF. Um, all of these agents have a much higher specificity and sensitivity for prostate cancer compared to either fluciclovine or other previously developed imaging agents uh, and obviously CT and MRI. And so they really allow us to localize disease much more accurately. So how did your clinical trials lead to FDA approval of this drug? That's a good question. So this is an unusual circumstance, gallium-68 PSMA-11, where uh, academic institutions led to the approval of the imaging agent itself. Uh, so UCLA, in collaboration with us here at UCSF, we together uh, performed two pivotal clinical trials uh, that formed the basis for a new drug application, actually two new drug applications that were approved at both UCSF and UCLA. 
uh, those two trials, one was at initial staging, so imaging patients who had intermediate to high-risk prostate cancer prior to definitive therapy, such as radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy. And the second was a time of biochemical recurrence, when that PSA starts to rise after definitive therapy, trying to localize where the metastatic disease was. So how did your 2015 RSNA research seed grant lead to your subsequent success in prostate cancer research? So it's an interesting tale. Uh, so what's interesting about it is the uh, RSNA grant was not in prostate cancer. Uh, it was in neuroendocrine tumors. And it really highlights how sometimes you never know the how the path you're going to go down ends up and leads you to a different place. So in neuroendocrine tumors, we were studying the use of gallium-68 dotatoc a very similar uh, molecule, but that targets the somatostatin receptor in neuroendocrine tumors. Through that research, we bought gallium generators. Uh, we did a lot of the IND work that was needed to get drugs uh, open into human trials, and we were able to translate that quickly to gallium PSMA11. If we hadn't been doing neuroendocrine tumor research at the time, uh, then it would have been very, very difficult to have actually opened up these studies with gallium PSMA11. The other thing that was odd was that the trial that we were going to run through that study uh, was actually to evaluate how yttrium-90 radioembolization could be imaged using gallium-68 dotatoc for a response assessment. And uh, with the approval and the availability of lutetium dotatate, lutathera, the treatment, uh, PRT treatment, uh, that therapy was really no longer used very frequently. And so we actually converted the grant over, and thankfully the RSNA was willing to allow us to do this, to actually study PSMA PET instead and look at how we can modulate the expression of PSMA PET with AR or angin receptor target therapies. Uh, interestingly enough, that, that actually ended up leading to an R01 uh, to evaluate how we can modulate PSMA expression uh, and is we're still ongoing right now and hopefully going into humans. So translating from our preclinical animal work into humans, hopefully this year, uh, all sort of started by an RSNA seed grant. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Hope. No problem. Thank you very much. For the latest updates, scientific research, and videos, visit rsna.org news.